Hello everyone and welcome to module two. In module one, we discussed some chronic neurological conditions and chronic psychological conditions. As I mentioned in some of those lectures, many of the conditions will be managed by specialists. However, as a primary care provider, it is important for you to know the recommended management plan in order to make sure that your patients are being treated and following up appropriately. Not to mention the fact that neuro and psych are two of the most difficult specialties to get our patients into. So sometimes we have to be able to start the management plan prior to the patient being seen by the specialist. In module two, we're going to discuss chronic dermatological conditions like psoriasis, seboric dermatitis, and skin cancer. I definitely manage all of these conditions in my primary care office. As a primary care NP, you do have to be aware of suspicious skin lesions and know when to biopsy. I always err on the side of caution and biopsy anything that I'm not 100% sure of. The only way to be absolutely positive that a skin lesion isn't malignant is to biopsy it. What you do with the patient after the biopsy depends on the results and your practice. Obviously, for a melanoma, you would refer to dermatology. However, I have had several patients in my practice that have had basal cell carcinomas that we remove. If the margins are clean, there's really no reason to refer. If the margins aren't clean, you could refer to derm or have the patient come back in so you could take a bigger area, whichever you're comfortable with. We will also be discussing glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy in module two. These are really the only chronic H-E-E-N-T conditions that are common in primary care. Glaucoma is generally diagnosed by an eye doctor, but it's definitely important for the primary care NP to recognize glaucoma meds and be aware of the drug to drug interactions of those meds because there's quite a few. As diabetes is so common in primary care, diabetic retinopathy is also common. The important thing to remember with this is the screening. Diabetics should be screened at least every two years when there's no retinopathy present. Usually, if they're diagnosed with retinopathy, they'll be seen annually or more. Finally, we're going to talk about chronic respiratory conditions. These we see all of the time in primary care. Asthma is very common both in children and adults, so you need to know how to manage asthma, as well as how to manage asthma exacerbations. The same is true for COPD. How do we diagnose it? With PFTs. How do we treat it, both pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically? How do we manage those exacerbations? For both of these conditions, it's important to incorporate patient education and health promotion. Patients should be encouraged to stop smoking and to get their recommended immunizations. For these common conditions, we don't generally refer unless we've got the patient on several medications and we still aren't able to control the symptoms. That's when the referral would come in. So it's really important that you understand the guidelines for management of these. If you're in primary care, you will be managing patients with asthma and COPD. The other respiratory conditions that we are going to touch on a little are lung cancer and sleep apnea. You should know the risk factors and the recommendations for screening for lung cancer. Sleep apnea is another super common condition and one that seems to be underdiagnosed. You need to know the risk factors for sleep apnea and when to order a sleep study. The sleep specialist will take care of the CPAP if necessary, as well as the CPAP settings. Usually patients with sleep apnea don't even know how bad they feel until the sleep apnea is treated and they don't feel that way anymore. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. But they didn't really even know they felt bad in the first place. <laughs> there are several videos in the Moodle book for this module that help explain these conditions. Some of the videos may be review for you, such as the pathophysiology of asthma. If you don't feel like you need a review, you don't have to watch it. 
Although I do think that those Khan Academy videos are an excellent resource and I would highly recommend them. Videologically, if that's a word, technologically, um, they are far superior to anything I would be able to put together. Um, they've got illustrations and uh, I just think they're really great videos. So I definitely encourage you to watch those. You'll also find some voiceover PowerPoint lectures, especially in the respiratory book. Those are from me and they cover the clinical guidelines for treatment of these conditions. You definitely will want to watch those and listen to those. I've also added a file on the Moodle page um, with a couple of examples of PFT results for you to look at. This is what you would see in your office if you ordered PFTs, pulmonary function tests. Take a peek at those after you go through the respiratory stuff and see if you can come up with a diagnosis. Um, I had a, a former student who worked in a pulmonology office and she provided those to us a couple years ago. So take a look at those and see if you can diagnose um, based on those results. As far as your assignments for this module, you do have a clinical note due. This clinical note will be based on the iHuman patient that you're required to complete for this module. Please, please, please look at the rubric and the template for the clinical note. I do require you to provide evidence for everything that you do or order for the patient in the note. If based on symptoms, for instance, you feel like you need to order an x-ray, I want you to find evidence to support that order. What clinical guideline recommends the x-ray and why? You need to do this for every test that you order, every medication that you prescribe, and every non-pharmacological treatment you recommend. We don't just come up with treatment plans on our own or because someone else does something, like uh, the physician that we work with does something, so that's why we did it. As nurse practitioners, we have to be able to utilize the best evidence in making our treatment decisions. Our treatment decisions have to be based on evidence, not based on what other people are doing or what we've always done or what we think needs to happen. Another area that students struggle with in the clinical note is the review of systems and the physical exam. You should be performing focused assessments. So if you are seeing a patient for an asthma exacerbation, for instance, you don't need to ask about joint pain in their foot or do a breast exam. Every single piece of your documentation should be related to the chief complaint of the patient. This is important for a couple of reasons. If you ask a lot of questions um, that are unrelated to the chief complaint, or you perform unnecessary components of the physical exam, and then you bill at a higher level, so you bill at a, maybe you bill at a 214 instead of a 213, that's fraud. You're committing fraud by adding in a bunch of stuff and billing at a higher level um, when it's not necessary. Furthermore, when you're practicing, you have 10 to 15 minutes with e each patient. You have to be able to get to the point to be thorough yet succinct, or you will get really behind, which leads to unhappy patients and unhappy employers. All that being said, remember, you will lose points if you have irrelevant information in your clinical note. The last thing you have for this module is the quiz, which opens at the beginning of the module and closes on the last day of the module. So be sure to get that done when you're ready. If you have any questions about the content for this module or the clinical note, please be sure to post those in the questions and answers forum. As always, let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here to help. I'll see you soon.